Aperture. Thank you on behalf of all three of us for, for a very nice introduction and thank you to Barbara Escobar and Elena Tarchi, is that how you pronounce it, for uh, helping with the logistics. I suppose I'm sitting over on this side of the stage uh, so that I can advance and <clears throat> repeat the slides, but also uh, so that I can give a, you know, it's, it's a little awkward to have someone who's just written a book have to present him or herself on the book, so it's good to have another voice. Um, and then uh, I did put together a show on Shomei Tomatsu, but uh, I would not claim to be a great expert, only a very interested uh, student of his work. But it is good to triangulate things, and so I like that there are three of us here, uh, and there are three of us on the screen, as it were. Uh, three of them and three of us. And uh, this is a picture which I think is in your book. Certainly there's another of, of uh, what's her name, Etsuko Nakamoto. The, this, this woman here is in the book. She's in the book. Yeah, but may, it may be in a different view. But this is, this is, this is a, you know, a well-known view that could certainly belong in chewing gum and chocolate, but perhaps not. And so I want to return to triangulation and to uh, what is and is not in the series as we go along. But why don't I start, Leo, by asking you because I've known you uh, for a while, and I know that uh, for a much longer period you, you knew Tomatsu and you worked on his photographs and helped guide the show uh, at SF MoMA and Japan Society. Is putting this book out the culmination of many, many years of, of wanting to do that, or was there a turning point in your thinking about his work uh, that led you suddenly five or six years ago or whenever to want to make this book. Yeah, it, uh, neither one actually. Um, I, uh, I thought I was done uh, with Tomatsu when the, I, I, it, it, I, I was guest curator of San Francisco MoMA's uh, retrospective of Tomatsu's work which came out as a, uh, a book called Skin of the Nation. It was published in 2004. And after that I thought I was finished. Um, John Yunkerman, who had worked with me as sort of a liaison to uh, a liaison between the museum and Tomatsu, and had worked with me translating things and so on, um, though said afterwards, you know, can we do something else? Um, what else? And he wanted to do a new edition of Tomatsu's famous book on uh, Nagasaki, and to do it for uh, what was it, the 60th? anniversary of the Nagasaki bombing. Um, and he attempted to put that together with Tomatsu, and Tomatsu was too difficult about it, couldn't do it. So he came back to me and said, you know, what else is there that's worth doing? Well, the only body of Tomatsu's work that had never been published, substantial body of work, that had never been published as a, an independent freestanding book was this one. Mm -hmm. So it was rather obvious that uh, you know, if one was going to try to complete Tomatsu in print, this was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Tomatsu, I should add, Tomatsu himself had wanted to do this as a book, um, but he, he, the publisher he had had lined up for it back in uh, 1968 or 69 went bust, and so it never happened. And uh, and and in in order to prepare that book before the publisher went bust, had, had Tomatsu gathered together all the images he thought should be in it, or how did you yeah, do that? I don't know, and I, I don't think anyone knows. Um, it's amazing how much information gets lost. Even with people you, you feel you know and are right there, and, and then the moment there's a death, you discover that you know 80% of what you want to know went into the grave with them, and, and yeah. there's no getting it back. So I don't know the answer to that. Tomatsu did publish a, a block of this work in a book that he did called Nippon in 1969. 1969, um, yeah. And that's a, a very lovely book, and it was a very lovely selection, but it was in no sense comprehensive. It didn't have anything, for example, from Okinawa, which became so important. Which to is play. where this picture which is where this taken. Is from. Right. So, but let's explain the conceptual framework mm -hmm. of the series. So uh, this work, all of this work in Chewing Gum and Chocolate, is work that uh, is concerned with the American military in Japan, uh, either American military people or American military bases, or the towns that surround the bases, which are often full of uh, nightclubs, bordellos, 
drinking places, etc. All of that base town life today um, is, is vastly reduced from what it once was. When I was a child in Japan, I, I didn't mention I grew up there, but that was how I became interested in, in Tomatsu. Um, I, I was told that at the end of the 60s, there were 150,000 American military people in Japan all the time, which is an enormous number. Of course, it itself was way down from the number who had been there during the occupation, which must have been you know, half a million or, or perhaps even more. So and we'll just interject. The occupation was the, the less than a decade, but you know, years up until 1952 when uh, America controlled the Japanese government. He controlled the Japanese government and had a large standing army and navy there. After 52, America retained bases in Japan, but they became smaller and smaller over time. Um, the period when I was there as a kid was the, the peak of the Vietnam War, and there were many, many. It was a major staging base for Vietnam, Japan was. Um, but then the number diminished, and after that, the, the Vietnam War ended, uh, diminished substantially. And so today, the largest number of uh, American military people present in Japan uh, is in Okinawa, uh, an island far to the south of the Japanese mainland, and in many ways culturally somewhat separate uh, and, and distinct, different from, from mm -hmm. mainland Japan. It should also be said that after the occupation of Japan ended in 1952, the American government, the American military retained Okinawa for another 20 years as a sort of garrison island of its own. And the negotiation um, through which Okinawa eventually reverted to Japanese government uh, was very slow and torturous and took a long time. And it wasn't until 1974 that reversion occurred. Um, and, and today, which is, now we're, what, 40 years up beyond that, um, there's still a great deal of, of uh, political strife over the continuing presence of American military people in Okinawa. It's an issue in, uh, in elections, it's an issue in party politics, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Well, let's, uh, I'd like to get to your so, uh, take, okay, yeah. we'll finish no, up and then I want to ask so Dr. This Tezuka This body about. of work of Tomatsu was concerned with the American military in Japan as opposed to other kinds of Americans in, in Japan. And he was himself uh, very angry at the Americans for having that large military presence during the later 1960s. He was, you know, part of the leftist movement of that, yeah. that period and expressed a lot of anger in this work. So are there other, um, and now I'm turning to you, Dr. Tezuka, so are there other uh, artists, photographers, other bodies of work that you have presented to Japan society or that you know of coming out of Japan addressing the American military presence there? Maybe just to give a, a, broad, a context beyond Tomatsu himself on this subject. Well, um, I actually specialize in 1950s and early 1960s Japanese art, art in general, not just photography. Right. So um, my uh, research focus, in fact, was the um, influence of American occupation on emerging artists in the immediate post-war period. Uh, so oftentimes uh, you you hear artists' names like um, uh, Genpei Akasegawa or uh, Naka, Nakanishi, Natsuyuki Nakanishi, whose mm -hmm. show is just at uh, McCaffrey Gallery, um, who uh, came together in early 60s um, to uh, kind of contextualize the uh, political social political condition of Japan within the artistic uh, milieu of the time, uh, which had a lot to do with their reaction um, towards the Americanization of Japanese society at the time. So that's like the generation similar to um, uh, right. where Thomas comes from. Born so. 1930, so yeah. 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 But, but those artists, if I know the work, if I'm remembering it well enough, uh, are not uh, d directly picturing the American military 
However, that comment cuts both ways. One could also say that Tomatsu, in addressing this subject, is also not limited to depictions of the American military. But, but am I right at least to say that it, to see a picture of an American army officer or soldier, it, that's something that seems a lot more prevalent in Tomatsu's work than others of the time? Or, or is it a more general I mean, thing I that one could see? I think it's, like, photography as a medium definitely has the more direct uh, depiction of the presence of American military uh, people mm -hmm. at the time. But um, artists from the 50s, for instance, uh, Hideko Fukushima, who was a part of the um, early 50s um, artistic movement uh, called Jiken Kobo, Experimental Workshop, right. has painted a series of paintings okay. Uh, abstract, but um, titled uh, like American uh, military, like general or things like that. Mm -hmm. So the presence of American mm -hmm. uh, might in post in Japan in, in Japanese is... art was clearly um, uh, felt by a lot of artists from that generation and, uh -huh. and earlier as well. And depicted and expressed. Well, that's important because I think for us all here, you know, this seems clear, uh, but could also be presented as one person's obsessive inquiry, and it's not the case, as you're saying. It's actually, there's a climate, uh, you know, that's trying to come to grips uh, with this situation. But I'm going to jump in now, and, and I, I, I'm going to change the picture soon, because I hate when you sit at a talk and they make you stare at one thing for a half an hour and nobody actually discusses it. So, so uh, I do want to talk about this and other things, and I'm going to start to try to get at the the excellence of your book, Leo, and its specificity, uh, because the, the series is actually quite complicated, and I think hopefully if there's time in the next hour, we can return to even what its borders are, um, because it, it may be, and I'll just throw out, that the reason it was the only unpublished series is that it's either not quite or more than a series. But let's, let's just hold that for a second and, and start with this picture. For, for me, uh, and Tomatsu is really a genius at, at attacking an extremely large problem, which is, which is the problem of the American presence in Japan, but which isn't, how to put it, simply a, a news issue. It's, it's a profound shift in society that has its own kind of internal mm, complicated problems to work through. And, and Tomatsu is really good at triangulating this problem, or more than triangulating it. So I wanted the picture of three people up here. And the first way he triangulates it, in my view, is that he takes pictures of, and, it, and in his writing, importantly, addresses the identity and actions of black American soldiers. Okay, so America is already a differentiated entity in how he depicts it. There are, there are white American soldiers and black American soldiers, and he makes it very clear, as far as I can tell from his writings, that they're not living the same life. Uh, so, and then they produce mixed race children, okay, and, and this is one of two ways I think that Tomatsu differentiates the problem vis a vis the Japanese. One, that there are not purebred Japanese involved in this situation, and two, that there are Okinawans involved in this situation, and Okinawans are not mainland Japanese and have a very different life. So right away with those few statements, it's a lot, I think, more uh, subtle and complicated than America and Japan. And so we've been looking at this picture, but uh, maybe why don't I turn it back to either of you to comment on you know, what you see in this picture, because this for me, is one of his absolute best pictures, anyway. Well, um, looking at this, it just reminds me that at one point I was really interested in perhaps thinking about an exhibition focusing of, on the base culture, like mm -hmm. the American base culture. And that doesn't have to be specifically Japan. I mean, there are other uh, U.S. military bases <laughs> yes. all over the world. So what if we... We specialize. Yes, so what that. if we just, you know, look yeah. at what kind of um, u unique uh, or um, uh, a unique culture that they created, not necessarily consciously, but it just naturally happened within the specific um, uh, cultural route that they found the base in. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Okinawa one and I'm also I'm actually from 
Kanagawa Prefecture, so there are a number of American military bases like Atsugi and uh, Yokosuka and Yokohama, and there is definitely a presence felt. Mm. And um, and I'm talking about 80s, so when you think about 60s and 70s, there must have been a, a kind of uh, clearer separation or identification of this sort of uh, base culture that was seen as uh, um, like the other within mm-hmm. in Japan. So Tomatsu definitely has an eye for really capturing that kind of um, uh, separation or like strange hybrid hybridity, but at the same time, this sort of social separation from the mm-hmm. rest of Japan. I think um, until uh, uh, the end of the, until the beginning of the occupation, um, uh, black people were extraordinarily rare in Japan. Um, most Japanese people probably had never seen one. Um, all of a sudden, uh, they came in in some sort of numbers as soldiers and sailors. Um, and so, uh, you know, they were an obvious, immediate, you know, visual symbol uh, for Tomaso and for everyone else, I think, of the arrival of something extraordinarily strange and new. Um, for some people, there must have been an element of racism, and they must have seemed threatening, frightening, and you certainly get that in some of, of Tomatsu's pictures. And, and for other people, they may have been you know, more of a curiosity, and certainly by the 60s and, in, and the period of the, the rise of the student left, uh, certainly among Japanese bohemians and, and intellectuals who were greatly involved with jazz, they would have been seen as cool and exciting and uh, you know, special people to be with. But I think there's another element of this, and, and you have to go um, farther back into Tomatsu and his history to get it, and that is that he saw himself as a hybridized person. Mm. And his own hybridity was the result of, on one hand, um, his having been subject as a child to the depredations of the militarists who ran his school, who were responsible for uh, the war and, and for the destruction of the country, and he loathed them, he hated them. And then on the other hand, the Americans arrived and he wasn't so happy about them either. <laughs> In fact, he didn't like it either direction he looked at. And yet, at the same time, he always saw the Americans as to some degree liberators. And I don't think that that meant in his mind. Yeah. Uh, it could have, but I don't think it did mean primarily political liberators. They were that. But I think it meant primarily cultural liberators, because it was the Americans who said, you can have jazz, you can have personal freedom, you can have romantic love, you can do what you want, you don't have to die at the age of 16 for the sake of an ideology that other people who have imposed upon you. And so the arrival of the Americans was a a very mixed sort of thing for him. It was both a blessing and an imposition, and it turned him into the girl in the middle of the picture. Yeah, and so I'll I'll now give a a little reading of my own of this picture, which is quite frankly guided by Tomatsu's writings, and you should never take an artist only at his word, but nevertheless, he's quoting her and I'm sorry, it's, it's, I think Nakamoto is the last name, and I'm just I blanking on the, name, but, the yeah. first, I think Etsuko. But anyway, and she says something like, uh, I was born, so there's nothing to be done about it. She spits out. That's yeah. his quote. Uh, but what I want to do is marry a black man and go live in America. The people I like are black. The people I hate are Japanese. And then he goes on to expand this quote and say, she is something like, she is not the only one to hold this view. You often hear in Okinawa phrases like, Japan used us and threw us away, or blah, blah, blah. And by doing this, he's generalizing from the comments of a mixed race, you know, half black woman to the sentiments of Okinawans. I mean, it's, it's quite a leap. And the more you think about it, the more of a leap it is. Uh, bec- but I, I'm not sure he's so much generalizing as, as stating um, something that for many people is a fact. So, for example... I, but in other I, words, he doesn't separate her out from other Okinawans as much. I mean, that's, no, I think, and, and she's signal. a good representative. But, I mean, I was shocked in, 19, in uh, 
oh, what year was it? 2002, I went over and went, uh, Tomaso had a big retrospective in Okinawa that year. And so I went to it and all the Tokyo people came down and there was a big party and all that. And he gave a lecture, huge hall, all filled with people and mostly local people. And the Okinawans were furious at him. And they were shouting at him, who are you, a Japanese, right. to come here right. and photograph right, 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 in this right. place and tell us who we are? And they referred to him, not even as a Japanese, they referred to him as a Yamato person, right? Which, I, I, it's too complicated to explain here, but for them to do that at that moment in time was an extraordinarily... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, angry gesture to make. And Tomasu sat there on the stage trying to say, you don't get it, I love well, you that's, people. That's, and they said, you're right, we don't get it, we don't buy it. Um, well, so, but he anyway. put himself in that position, did, which is course, an act yeah. of courage. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that kind of um, diversity and multiplicity of cultures within Japan has long been neglected. So, yeah, I mean, like exactly. if you go to Okinawa, I'm called mainlander. Yeah. You know, I'm not Okinawan. If I go to Hokkaido in North, I'm mainlander because right. I'm not right. part of their root culture. So there are different cultures yeah. within Japan. So like in a very unique way, in the post-war period after the American occupation, we actually witnessed the birth of another culture within Japan, which is base culture that I right. really feel right. like depicted in you know, uh, Tomatsu, work. and it might, from the perspective of Okinawans and other people, it might have seen as almost like orientalizing or fantasizing about mm -hmm. this like uniquely new identity or something that doesn't really fit into the political or like a conventional idea of Japanese identity. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that kind of friction within Japan. And, and uh, something I love about Tomatsu, and I'll get off this picture now, is he tries to resist as much as possible, I think, this romanticizing about the identities. I mean, I'm, I'm really struck by how the three of them are each looking a different direction. There's nonconformism built into the picture. They're not together. There's a gap between them like there's a gap between us. And, you know, she's looking off somewhere there, and she's looking over here, and he's engaging the photographer. And, and maybe he's the surest of himself, I don't know. I mean, you can read too much into things, but it's a beautiful composition, but it is not a, how to put it, it's tight but not unified. So anyway, I'll, I'll get off that now, but let's see, I'm trying to think. So is this, yeah, I know there's someone in the audience with a special attachment to this picture, so I'll just say, this is one of the first pictures I saw by Tomatsu, and it's very early, and I think it has a different, approach, but it's a, after a typhoon in Nagoya, in his home uh, region, and I, it took me a while, but I've sort of settled on a reading of it where even, a na and there is no natural, there's no such thing as a natural disaster, because a typhoon comes, and, an, and a probably Western-made, American-made boot is left upright and vertical and able to walk on where the Japanese sandal is like off on the side. I don't, I just, I see time and again in Tomatsu's work, and this is what I wanted to ask about, where does the series begin and end? The, the things that seem the most abstract or the most natural, like the sea or the asphalt, or asphalt abstract, sea natural, let's say, are not. They're, the sea is patrolled by U.S. boats and they think there are atomic bombs underneath, like stored underneath the ocean. You know, the asphalt, we have a picture here. Uh, you know, a total abstraction, and yet it could only, it's only possible once you have asphalt-paved streets, which is something I think that Americans at least spread, or, or it's not even Americans, the Japanese modernized, but as a result of World War II. So it's hard to know where the American presence begins and ends, right? Yeah, I, I would not have um, uh, looked for the Americans all that much in... in in this picture, mm -hmm. but the, the previous one, um, I, you know, one thing that happens a lot in Tomasu's work is, and he would say this, he would say, uh, you know, a photograph can only be made in the present. Unlike filmmaking, you know, you can't go stage something that happened 200 years ago and, and make, uh, you could stage it, but, right. uh, you know, it would be obviously fraudulent. So we understand somehow that whatever you do in a photograph, you're doing right now. Nonetheless, it seemed to me that um, Tomatsu's work is full of ghosts. 
And so often when he shows you something that's now, it's full of implications of what happened before. So in this case, we are looking at the Isebe typhoon, of, you know, the after effect of the Isebe typhoon of 1958 or whatever, but we're also looking at all those beach invasions of the South Pacific Islands in mm -hmm. which the Japanese army was relentlessly ground to pieces by the Americans. And, you know, where after a, a, a marine landing or an army landing took place, you know, the water against and, and the beaches themselves would be filled with rubbish that, you know, this seems somehow to remind us of. But the next picture that you had here, which is from a series asphalt that he did at the very beginning of the 1960s, um, I actually remember this phenomenon because when I was a kid there, I used to stand there at the street corner and look down at the asphalt and see exactly this. And what, what yeah. you're seeing here is trucks full of junk used to go through the, the city streets in Tokyo and I suppose the other cities too. And they would bounce because the pavement was rough. And all these little metal parts and shavings that were yeah. piled up in the truck would bounce off and they would fall to the ground and because development, economic development in that period was so headlong and so rapid and so, you know, it was like a storm of sudden economic growth, right? The asphalt that was used in the streets to make the streets was relatively cheap and it would get soft if the weather even got mildly warm and so all this stuff got right. pressed down into it. And you would look, and it was like looking up at the night sky, except you were looking down at the... Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice comparison. I, I have myself, how to put it, when I see this picture, I only look down. Uh -huh. I like that you look up. Um, but I'm probably just, I don't know, incapable of, of um, um, more beauty or something. It, I, for me, the, the, first of all, these are two gorgeous prints, really. And this is, the red in this is made simply with a marker. So it's the most low-tech you could imagine. And it fits the subject, which is the most low-tech way to create abstraction you could imagine. And, and that, to me, is fantastic. I mean, there's a long lineage in modern art, right, of making gritty abstraction. And he did it, and not just once, but there's a whole, a whole series here. And similarly, this piece, uh, at least in the early prints I've seen, including this one, is it's luscious but not beautiful. But it, it totally sucks you into the mud. Uh, he really, I, here's another picture that maybe, well, there's the rage. He, this is his friend Takuma Nakahira, the rage he felt. But um, let's see if I can, can I come around to things? Yes, okay, yeah. So on this, oh, sorry, on the subject of putting you down, I, this also to me is a totally incredible picture, which is in your book. And I mean, anyone, please, also in the audience, feel free to, talk about what this inspires in you. First of all, I don't know whether he is lying on the ground or he's put his camera on the ground, don't but it doesn't that. matter. I mean, to put yourself in this position. That's why I said it took a lot of courage to sit in front of that audience and be yelled at. And it is, of course, different to be con confronting Americans than to be con confronting other Japanese. But to do this uh, is just uh, amazing to me. It, to, it's like restaging the invasion or something. Mm, yeah, it is. Uh, and that, that is an, an incredible act of, of courage. So, I don't know. I just put it up there for us all to <laughs> stare at. Do you want to say something about it? I did think, um, I did think a bit about uh, the, the huge wave of Japanese performance art in the 60s, which also tends towards self-abnegation, like Yoko Ono having people come up and cut her with scissors, cut her clothes off with scissors on stage. Or um, you know, Mono Hod, I mean, High Red Center doing the like putting clothespins all over them and walking through the streets. Maybe you want to say something more about that. Maybe it's unrelated to this. But. Uh, well, well the, the part of this uh, image uh, reminds me of exactly the High Red Center's kind of performance uh, that brought art to the street. So that was the you know kind of the movement of that period in the 60s. Um, 
from early to late 60s. So that kind of engagement with the reality of the world mm. uh, started to seep into the world of art. So mm. that uh, definitely relates to how you know Thomas is going out there on the street. Is it, was there were those performances reviewed by critics who who cast any sense of shame on the artists for doing this? I mean, the artists are making fools of themselves in public. Let's well. just say, in the I don't. I mean that in the best sense, but they're very sure, deliberately. Sure. I mean, like this is. It's just. Uh, I can't describe the. Sen I feel shame looking at this, <laughs> but I don't know if that was that a, a widespread. Uh, well, sentiment. by sixties, there was a um, a number of critics who could actually uh, put their activities, like really cutting edge avant garde activities, not just within the scandalous like a journalism but actually see them as in the lineage of Japanese avant-gardism so mm -hmm. I think they were not you know completely laughed at or anything the lot of things that I mean, might relate to how Tomatsu's works are kind of traces of something that surrounds people or happened before mm -hmm. that in like 1960s um, avant-garde artists in Japan were starting to recognize the invisible structure around them, whether that is American post-occupation or neo-colonialism or the Japanese government or the institutional system that was building up in uh, late 50s to early 60s Japan as national museum system. So that kind of... Um, uh, like not not direct but indirect reference to the um, structures that are starting to be built and starting to confine people's uh, activities and ideology um, became the target or the subject of art in mm -hmm. the 60s. So I think that might those, yeah, yeah that might continue to what the photographers were reacting to at the time as well. Hmm. Here, I'll leave some street art up so to talk. There you go. If, go if ahead, you go, Leo. If you go back, <laughs> go, go back again to the, okay. the one you're on, um, which is, you know, this is, of course, a staged photograph. And sure. Tomatsu was playing with these, these Marines. And he, you know, who suggested that they do this thing they're doing here? You know, with him getting down under the boot, was it the Marines who suggested it or Tomatsu who suggested it? Who knows? Um, was it uh, a, uh, uh, a fun game? Was it, um, uh, you know, obviously it's brutal. Um, it did the brutal. Marines know how brutal the thing they were acting out was? Who knows? Anyway, I wanted to read you in connection with it, uh, you know, just two quotations. One from Tomatsu himself. And this is, uh, this is something he, he said in an interview rather late in his life, but he could have said it any time. Um, and he said, at the time of the defeat in 1945, having lost my home, dressed in tatters, and facing days of hunger, the first English words I uttered at age 15 were, give me. When I reached out my hands, American soldiers passed me chewing gum and chocolate, I encountered America in this way as the foreign country that appeared in the form of an occupying army. Now, much earlier, uh, the novelist uh, Akiyuki Nozaka wrote a story, a famous story, called uh, American Hijiki. And uh, this is in translation. And he, it says, uh, he wrote, uh, Give me cigaretto, chocoretto, thank you. No one who's begged from a soldier could carry on a free and easy conversation with an American. Compared to the Japanese, an American is a shining star. Look at those muscular arms, that massive chest. How can you not feel ashamed? Hmm. Okay? So, so there, there is, yeah. He's come, so Tomatsu is coming, you know, at least in this photograph, you know, very much out of, of you know, the emotion that... Uh, Nozaka expresses, but then there's another whole side to Tomatsu, um, which is rather more forgiving and more loving, and it's the contradiction between those two things that, to me, yeah. is what really gives his work its life. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, but I would add to that, for me, 
and again, it's it's quite a it's no doubt an unformed and personal reading of his work, but uh, or uninformed. But he's also he, he you know in that quote you you read uh, a certain uh, stability is set up between the the shining heroic star and the abject. You know, Japanese Con- citizen, yeah. the conquered, the conqueror, and and Tomatsu manages to destabilize these oppositions. I think he he makes he 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 actually at the one point I might have a little disagreement in in your book in the very lovely essay is 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 that you you point toward his uh, what you say establishes a, a dignity, and I I think actually he 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 poke. He, he eats away at dignity for a long time and then maybe arrives at a different place. But it's, it's, not easy, it's just not easy for anyone to be totally dignified in this situation, I think. And, and, and this, I mean, this is just the figure of a cipher of a bomber plane, but it, um, it heads in that direction. And then, where is the, uh, there, yeah, Nakahira in the punching bag. There's, it, it's more anger. It's, I mean, the, but the anger is, how to put it, is not... It's omnidirectional and, and doesn't have a, a target to really attack because the target is so big. You know, I, and this gets to the question of the, the boundaries of the project. Too. Yeah, ex- Because exactly. Japan in 1959, the world in 1959, 1960, when he began this project, was quite different from the world in 1968, 69, and 70, when the entire explosion that we call the 60s had taken place and was taking place in Japan just as much as it was in Paris and just as much as it was in Berkeley and New York and all over the United States. And I think that Tomatsu was both, (laughs) how could he be this? He He was both one of the authors of that eruption right, in Japan, Mm -hmm. and at the same time, he was driven by that eruption. One way or another, by 1969, he was a far angrier person than he had been in 1959, Mm. right? It's strange to think of because, in fact, Japan was much freer of the United States in 1969 than Mm. it was in 59, and the war was much farther away in the past, and Japan had restored itself and had become a great economic power and... You know, was uh, was a world power again by by the end of the sixties, and yet Tomatsu was angrier at the end of the sixties. Yeah. Um, the what this means in terms of the work itself is that the work that he did in the later sixties, as part of the chewing gum and chocolate series, is actually much more politi- uh, polemical, much more strictly political, much angrier. Uh, much more locally angry work, much more dedicated to the issue of how do we get the Americans out of Okinawa, where the earlier work was more historically minded, was looking back at the occupation, which was actually over before he began photographing. It was probably more poetic. One of the problems that we had putting this book together was that there is actually more Okinawa work from the later, he didn't go to Okinawa, by the way, for the first time until '69. He wasn't let in, um, and there's much more Okinawa work than there is earlier work. How could you make a book yeah. which had any sort of consistency of, of feeling, any poetic consistency, from one end to the other, when there was such an imbalance and when the Okinawan work hmm. was so pointedly political? And it was a real struggle to pull the two halves of it mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. and achieve something that seemed like a, an even mix. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. You, you may or may not feel it was successful. I, for me, the book's too new to even quite know myself. <laughs> um, and this is just an example. And this is from the show, sorry, the show that we had at the Art Institute. Uh, and this is a group of works made all in 1969 and showing uh, student protests and street demonstrations, but mixing them, as Tomatsu did in his books of the period, mixing them with uh, frank sexual encounters uh, there there and there. You have this actually staged uh, uh, a minor Bhutto dancer having sex with his girlfriend as a performance for Tomatsu's camera. Uh, but the, that's why I say that the anger and the violence are omnidirectional, and they're not, for instance... Uh, limited or focused on, uh, but I mean, I think you're quite right to say his writing and his 
his uh, activities become quite focused in the late 60s on these demonstrations, but the sense of an entire society in, you know, in emergency need of overhaul <laughs> it expresses itself through sex, through the street, through language. But you that know, was the that through, was the high sixties, and that was the high sixties yeah. here and in Europe as well. And it's very interesting that the the uh, the dissipation of that feeling occurred at almost the same moment in Japan as it did in the United States. the The Vietnam War ended. Okinawa was returned to Japanese government. Yeah. The Bohemian culture of of Shinjuku in Tokyo exhausted itself all at once, and Tomatsu went off at that same moment in 1973 to the far, far south of Japan, not to photograph American bases anymore, but to go live with rustic people whose lives had barely changed in 200 years and were living under thatch yeah. roofs and, you know, walking to till their fields and gardens. And he said, I'll never come home. I'm staying down here after this. Which of course, two years later, he turned around yeah. and went back. Yeah. Um, well, there's much to be said on that. I just want to dwell on this yeah. uh, for a sec. Just, and I'm sorry it's hard to see the images, but again, just to point out, and again, it's just where I'm coming from on this, but his insistence on, on rubbing our faces in it and his own face in it. I really see, he, he presents himself as in the problem, as in the trauma, in my view. In other words, he's, this is not a reportage on trauma, like you could open a book and just understand it and move on. He's, he, you're in it, and, and it's hard to see, but the mess left behind by the demonstrations there is, is the same kind of live, violent, filthy energy that's also in the two sex pictures to either side. And the quote, so we, the show is just like your book, because he's such an overwhelmingly great writer. It, you, it's very hard to just get at the photos and leave the writing aside. And I must thank Leo for providing me with as yet unpublished translations of nearly everything Tomatsu had written, uh, because I don't, I don't read or speak Japanese. So, but it's, it's overwhelmingly impressive and, you should all get the book, of course, and you should really read the essays in it. Uh, but so, so the words are in these pictures. That was the idea, and that the show would be like a book on the wall. And that quote there, if I remember right, there, I think there are two quotes there, but is um, he, he took a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre uh, and about a, an insane asylum at St. Anne's Psychiatric Clinic, and he says, a man starts screaming, and the guards you know, pin him down, and say, blow your nose. He blows his nose. What's your occupation? Shoemaker. And then he starts screaming again. You can't control, you cannot keep this violent energy down. And, and another quote that's on the same wall that I, that I just want to, you know, indulge our, whatever, our attention with uh, is um, from the, the, it gives the title to the photo series, I Am a King. And that's the one maybe missing part. It's hard to know how to address it in the book because it's not mostly about the occupation. But I think it, it really is also in the same way because it, the title is taken from a line from Muhammad Ali, who's not yet Muhammad Ali. He's Cassius Clay still. And if I remember the quote right, that, that, that the series is, is, is like in 10 parts and the first four parts don't have a title. And then like in the middle of the series, he realizes, I think, what he wants to do. And he quotes uh, Cassius Clay. He says, Something like he had, uh, he was all also known as the lips of Louisville and, and the, some, something really self confident. And he had pre uncannily predicted the exact round in which he would knock out his rival. And, and amazingly, his prediction came true. And he turned to the audience that had flown the hall. So, like, you know, Nakahira, is that, whoops, you know, there's no one there except Muhammad Ali. And he shouted, I am a champ, I am the greatest, and I am a king. And that gives the title of the series, a black American athlete shouting at nobody gives the title to this photo series and later to, a, to his great mid-career book. Again, it's incredible, I think, act of courage and putting yourself like on the bottom. You know, how can you be a king when you're that? So that, that's just my reading of it. <laughs> yeah, the... Um Mine's not too much different from yours, um, although I was always intrigued by the fact that, the Moha that when Muhammad Ali said what he said, 
he used the definite rather than the indefinite article, and he said, "I am the king." Oh, yeah. And yeah. there is and no Tomatsu there. Changes. There are well, no, no, no. There's no there's no a and the right. in Japanese. Oh. So Tomatsu got it wrong, and and he liked what he read, <laughs> right? And he said, "I'm going to use this," but he got it wrong, and so he yeah. he turned it into "I am a king." which is quite different in meaning from I am the king. Yeah. Um, and he used that for the title of the book, but not just for the title of the book, I am the king, but also for the title of the, the most substantial section, sequence of photographs in that book, right. right? which is the section, I am a king. And it goes on and on. It's big. It's yeah, like 50, 60 photographs, almost a, a book within a book. And what it's about, what I am a king is about, the essay, I'm a King, uh, is the resurgence of Japan. It's about, uh, about right. the, uh, you know, the economic flourishing, um, right. the economic miracle of the 1960s. And, it, and so to me, the meaning of the title in that mm. context was always, look, you thought we were down. You thought it was over for us. No, I mm. am a king, right? And, it, yeah, and there's huge national pride in it, huge, enormous national pride yeah. in both in the content of the essay and in the way that mm. that line uh, adapted from what Muhammad Ali is applied to the essay, right? Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not that far from what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, well, I don't know. I, shall we see if, if you're all still with us and have some questions about the book? or uh, Tomatsu generally? Or, yeah. Japanese photography generally, or um, I'm always interested in how Tomatsu is positioned as the forefather of contemporary Japanese photography. And to my eyes, it seems like his work is quite radical and very experimental. And yet, my understanding is that the next phase of contemporary Japanese photography with the Provoke era that really went to the extremes to try to disorient the viewer and to push the way that photography record, recorded the world or the subjectivity of the photographer. It seems very connected to me, but there, in the histories I've read, there is a point of break that people like Daido Moriyama and uh, Takuma Nakahira right were reacting in opposition to Tomatsu and to what they perceived as an overly humanistic approach to the world that Tomatsu mm -hmm. brought to his work. And I, I guess I'm interested to hear a little bit about, from each of you perhaps, about where you think he sits in that point of rupture between a sort of modernist Japanese photography and a more contemporary Japanese photography. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Tomatsu was was greatly criticized when his work first began to be published by the Japanese, uh, you know, uh, photography establishment of um, of those days. He was seen as, uh, you know, a, a radical and an unsavory departure from what was accepted. What did that mean? The establishment was mostly dedicated to a sort of journalism that was not, would not be terribly unfamiliar in this country. Um, you know, it was a magazine-based, a, 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 a mass media magazine-based uh, photography, which meant that, you know, there were certain subjects and the photographer went out and was supposed to make a picture that would illustrate what you understood about the subject. And uh, the photographer served the subject. Well, Tomatsu came along and began to make a kind of photograph that was vastly more subjective than what had been seen before. He really said, look, what's important is not the subject, what's important is how I see the subject, right? And in this, um, you know, he's quite consistent with what you were getting from Robert Frank in this country at the same time, um, and, and shortly afterwards from Winogrand, from Arbus, uh, from all the people who, you know, to us here, come, you know, came to stand for uh, the beginning of the understanding of photography as an expressive art. Now, 
the next people who came along were with Tomas's own protégés and friends, Moriyama, uh, mm -hmm. Nakahira, mm -hmm. right? They went so much farther out into the world of the subjective that they said, look, we don't even care if you're making pictures about Japan anymore. We don't care what you're making about. You can make, the, uh, Moriyama has a gorgeous photograph of six uh, fingernail pairings. You know, that's all they are, laid out on a table or a sheet or something. Uh, maybe they were his girlfriends or maybe they were his own or who knows. But that's how hmm. esoteric it was possible to become later. I don't think Tomatsu rejected those super hyper subjective photographers in the way he himself was rejected by his own predecessors. So he really did remain a, a sort of yeah. figure in the middle. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, what's that? Oh yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thought you had one. Uh, oh, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Go ahead. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. I think in the art field, that break kind of happened right around 1970, when the artists previously were much more vocal in a way, like engaging actively with the social and political conditions and reacting and expressing that way. But after the 1970s, particularly after the Expo 1970s, but Osaka, which to the Japanese avant-garde artists meant the kind of um, victory of the nation, right? The nation rather than the um, kind of individuals. Uh, so the artists, at least my understanding, the visual artists started to go inward rather than outward. So the engagement became not with the external world and ideology, but became more internal. Um, so the expression itself became internalized and also the subject matters they started to uh, depict in their work became more internal subjective matters. So that... Mm. Mm. Uh, let's see, what do I think about all this? I, I, I might have a bit of a different approach here, but not so much maybe. I, um, so this is Nakahira, who was not a photographer, uh, but who brought Tomatsu into uh, an important magazine, Modern Eyes, where he published his I Am A King essay and took up photography as, at Tomatsu's encouragement and then became radicalized. I, I would say politically, First, and I guess I would say the I don't find it subjective. I wish I had pictures to show you of Nakahira's work, but it's not, to my mind, so much uh, a greater state of subjectivity as a um, a much more extreme blinding, uh, a, a kind of a, a much more extreme. Uh, expression of our inability to see properly in these conditions. So, so that when you look at For a Language to Come, which I think is just like the masterpiece of, of Japanese photo books of, of the late 60s, early 70s, you, you, you just, you, you, the, the, it's like the picture comes out at you and you can't see what's happening and you're, it's, bull, it's running you over. The picture is running you over. So I feel like it's, it's an attack on subjectivity, uh, but I think that's a political radicalization, and we know it from the writings that, but in formal terms that Tomatsu had already um, set the stage for, and I think he was perhaps given insufficient credit because he was older by not so many years, but as I've been told that in Japan, like five years difference at that time meant like you were way old, you were old, and then 10 years you were really, really older. So. Um, he had, for instance, he had already um, made series of abstraction like asphalt. He had worked in color and black and white in alternation, which I don't know anyone else who did in the 60s like that. He had made multi-part photo essays where, like I said, the title shows up in the middle and the, the meaning is given at the end. So it's like in process as you go along, which is an incredible way to work. I think Tomatsu had done a lot of formal things that were really innovative, but maybe because he was these few years older, and it is true, he had an abiding faith in, in, like, in the little guy. I think Nakahira had no faith in anybody. So that's a, that's a difference. But, and you know, there's the man in action, I mean, total rage. Uh, but I don't, for me, it's not that it's more inward focused, it's actually extremely outward focused. And the, the, um, 
the, the failure in like 1970, 71 is Nakahira realizing or articulating, we're not going to be able to change this system. This is, forget it. These are a bunch of ragtag students who occupy some buildings for a few weeks and give up and it, we're stuck. This, this, you know, we're stuck in our mess. That's, and, and Tomatsu goes far away to recover. People like move out, but I think it's out of an enormous failure of a system or failure to be able to revolutionize the system. That's, again, that's my, my understanding of it. Yes. I've heard people say that one of the differences between Japanese photography and American photography in the 60s and 70s had to do with the fact that the Americans' goal was to get their prints on a wall in a museum or gallery, right, you know, and the right. Japanese wanted to get their prints into a mass market book form, a photo book form. Right. Question one, is this true? And if so, what kind of implications does it have? Uh, well. Leo has, has researched this a lot more. I'm actually, I've heard this for years and I don't say it's not true, but the more I look, the more shows I hear about and the more prints I see being produced. So I'm actually not clear on the answer to this. Uh, but the books are really important and the magazines are really important, absolutely. And the, I, I mean, the magazines that I've been able to look at make me think a lot of magazine culture in Europe in the 20s where an, an art director or an editor has a relative amount of freedom and can say to a photographer, you know, do, do what you want to do and we'll put it in print. Is that wrong? I don't know. There seems to be more of that than there is in the you States know, I at think that there, time. I think there's another um, element of it, which is that um, in Japan there, there was and is, not just in photography, but in other kinds of publishing too, um, you know, the idea that it's okay to make a book in a very small edition, which will sell out, and it'll be gone. And, and that's it. It's over. You don't do it again, right? Um, and maybe then after that you do another book. And maybe yeah. the, the, you know, the succeeding book even includes some of the material that was in the first one. And that's okay, too. It's different from our system in which we try to make a book which is going to be around for 30 years. We try to make classics. Books, I think, in Japan mm -hmm. can be treated as, as more ephemeral events. So what that meant in practice was that here in the States, when I began life as a photographer, it, to have a book was a very big deal. It was, you know, it was almost, you could have a show, but to have a book was extraordinary. And in fact, it was extraordinary because you had to persuade somebody that he or she should publish 12,000 copies of your book, which would never sell, you know, in order to publish the thing at all. Meanwhile, in Japan, the idea was, you make a book, sure, and then you make another, and maybe the book is only a 2,000 copy book and it sells for a dollar and a half, and that's fine, right? And so it meant that there was much more engagement with book making as a process on the part of the photographers. It wasn't something that you did once in your life and was inaccessible. It was something that you could do right now, this year, and do again next year. And the result was yeah. that they would make photographs for inclusion in books. You didn't try to make masterpieces yeah. that would stand alone on the wall in a separate frame and, right? yeah. and, and matted and all of that. You weren't trying to, 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 you know, to create the, you know, the great object of art with a capital A. You were trying to make a living thing called a book and to pour photographs into it as you went. So it was a different working process. Or, or, or even more radically, and this is a good probably point to, to end on since you've produced a book, which hopefully it will remain a classic, I think, for a long time. But uh, I think even more radically, you don't even have to think about a hierarchy of art making in Japan as regards photography. For better or worse, it just isn't on that hierarchy. But it is a lot more like live theater, which brings us back to the performances. And I think the books are seen and the shows are seen as things that come and go. I mean, even today, shows last two weeks and leave. I mean, it's crazy. crazy. But, 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 right, they, they just, just happen. happen. And, and that's, I mean, all of this is like this grand, cruel theater. And, and the out. result of this is that you can have something like Moriyama. You know, who at, at last count, I think, has published 400 books. And Araki, who has published 800 or something like that. Some of them are this big. But, you know, they've done that. Something like that is almost inconceivable in this country or in Europe. 
um, it's really unimaginable. <laughs> is there anyone who's done anything like that in the West? I, I remember like, talking to Eiko Hosoe, how like, he's concerned about editioning photography back in the 60s is such an uh, um, like, unusual yeah, idea yeah, amongst yeah, Japanese yeah, photographers yeah. because such a concept didn't exist, exist there at the time. Yeah, so there was a story I was told by a guy called uh, Ishihara, who was a, a prominent uh, dealer in Tokyo. Um, and the story, he, he represented Moriyama for some years, and there was a moment when Moriyama was quite desperate because he had no money, and he had a girlfriend who had gone away to Paris, and he needed to follow her to Paris, but he couldn't afford to get there. And so he went to Ishiara and said, uh, please, I need money, you know, to go to Paris. But the meaning of it is that photographers really didn't even, they didn't even try to keep their prints. There was no... Hmm. No special reason to, it wasn't thought to be valuable. And when, in fact, we then, in doing this book, tried to repeat what Moriyama had done and go back to those magazines and say, look, there are certain missing tomatsus. Do you have them, right? Yeah. All thrown away years ago. Yeah. Well, we hope none of you, you hope you'll all get the book and that none of you will throw it away. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for coming. I'm sure if you have more questions, everyone will stick around to answer them. Thank you.